Dear colleagues, good midnight Asia, good afternoon Europe, good morning United States. My name is Stanislav Lismond and I'm a leading application scientist at NDMDT Spectrum Instruments. And today I will be the moderator of our broadcast. So we are starting our first webinar for this year. It's called Integra Marlin, bringing SICM to your research. The technique of scanning ion conductance microscopy was first demonstrated at the dawn of scanning probe microscopy by Paul Hansma Group. The idea is really very attractive, to use a non-contact method to study the soft matter in liquid environment. However, the technical side of this wonderful technique developed rather too slowly. I admit that I myself was very skeptical about this method of microscopy until some time ago. At least the commercial solutions presented on the market left much to be desired. They either simply didn't work, from my experience uh, in the real conditions, or they didn't work satisfactorily. Thus, it will be really interesting for us to, to listen to today's lecturer, who will be they definitely dispel the doubts of the strictest skeptics. I have the honor to introduce Yuri Korchev, a professor of Imperial College London, uh, without exaggeration, a legend of scanning probe microscopy. He is the author of more than 150 scientific art articles. I even don't mention his Hirsch index, it's uh, really huge. The group under his leadership has done more for SICM than all the other scientific groups and commercial companies did overall. Actually, we planned that Yuri would broadcast uh, from our Moscow office and we uh, were planning to get some Guinness for St. Paddy's after this, uh, but uh, oh, we'll see how the borders are closing today due to coronavirus so he couldn't arrive. And uh, so the main part of our broadcast will be done directly from London. Finally, I would like to remind you that we are uh, on, lay on air and live in live mode, and you can use the question or chat window to ask your questions during the lecture. And in the end, we will try to answer them as much as possible. So Yuri, have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to talk, very strange time. London is gridlock. It's very funny because most of the university are closed down. People are a little bit scared, started to buy lots of things. Shops become empty. Very interesting time. Our cat at home become a little bit frustrated because normally she would have a good time sleeping in the daytime. Now she suddenly has a whole family at home and paying too much attention to it. So um, let's come to the science or what we try to say. Uh, we, I was uh, started my uh, research in Russia and then moved to London in the 90s. And, and I was electrophysiologist practically working with pipettes or nano pipettes, micro pipettes, to do electrophysiology and study itself. I like this instrument. I love nano pipettes or pipettes because you can do so many things. You can do intracellular recording, micro injection, aspiration, tons of things set up a different sensor and it's a very easy and simple flexible tool to operate very easy to make and you see the picture and at the moment uh mainly located at imperial college but i also have two labs uh, in moscow one in nisis and another one in kanazawa university we're running wpi program maybe you know under who work with uh, Atomic force microscopy actually worked there, and he started also to use their ion conductance microscopy for very rapid imaging. And here we try to introduce a new product, practically two company, our company is ICAPIC, which produce ion conductance microscopy and, and TMDT. And now with the joint pro product Integra Marlin, where we can combine the best of both because high resolution and very nice imaging with AFM with easy manipulation of biological sample and imaging with SICM, <clears throat> with non-contact mode. Just quickly, why uh, when Hansma started, it was a very nice, interesting idea, but it didn't go far because it was not that high resolution and more intended to study ion current through the sample, which is actually not possible. And But what was a little bit missed at the beginning is that PPAT is an interesting sensor. It's a Oops, sorry, it's not. Uh, oh, yeah. 
if you fill the pipette with nano pipette or micro pipette with uh, just normal physiological buffer <clears throat> and put in a solution and put a very light ionic current, practically watching electrodiffusion of ions, you would see a very interesting phenomena. When the pipette far from the surface, the current will be steady. But as soon as you approach, it's like a, a bottleneck. The electrodiffusion of ions become restricted by the sample. It doesn't matter what the conductivity of it the current will reduce, and you can use nicely this for the feedback control. So that means uh, it's a very, very simple and easy system to operate. <clears throat> Practically, nanopipette is a tool and it's very easy to produce. You've got the capillary, they cost nothing practically. You can use quartz, glass, many barrel, very different configuration, and use a commercial cooler, which is not made for electrophysiology, and in a minute you can produce the pipette and start imaging and it will be fresh absolutely clean you don't need to spend time it will cost you a pence so practically one of the paper was very interesting when the afm probe was produced a hollow inside so it can record uh, ion current at the same time and if you look at two approach characteristic one with atomic force microscopy and the place where it has actually feedback manage come to the contact with SICM approach when the current started to drop because diffusion was limited you see the current start drop much earlier so you can actually and typically we have a set point about 0.3 percent for imaging you actually far away from the sample so you actually flying over that it's a very nice proximity sense and practically when you move around the cell at constant distance you can grab nice image this is kind of 3d rendering of uh, neurons we image and you can see that you can go around and get quite easily and it's pointed down and it has some advantages is with a sensor and i will explain why because imagine the biological sum especially with what i'm targeting and our group uh, it's a very sharp probe and the sensor is only at the very tip when atomic force microscope will sense for any part of the tip. If it will be side contact, it will be sent. In this case, it's insensitive. So it requires uh, uh, better to uh, use a very special protocol to use this ability to get high resolution and no artifact like we will have in atomic force microscopy for elaborated sample, which practically will be impossible to image, but you will be doing with this uh, technique. We use a hopping protocol. What it means, if you just run in normal, like atomic force mi microscope force mode, uh, you can image that relative flat. But if you have, let's say, ball, you will have a collision because your side of the pipette will not sense anything. And you see the picture of a neuron underneath, you will create all the classical situation uh, system which run in a feedback control mode higher noise on the surface if you put a large gain you will hit the sample you will have a parachuting and lots of artifacts and damage introduced to the sample using the hopping is a very easy uh, to use and very uh, nicely fit to the keypad it's very sharp and any motion towards the sample is not obstructed there are no uh, interaction with the water it's not like a cantilever which will bend and reduce your speed response and you can get a perfect picture of your system. So the neuron on the right side, you see it's no damage and you can pick up a very fine detail with the same resolution everywhere. And uh, that means you can grab live image without any problem. And because you're not interacting with sample, it's like automatic car wash. You go there, you think, oh my goodness, it will crush my car, but no, the sensor, sense the distance and that is the advantage uh, of non-contact mode <clears throat> this is just example we use a variable resolution so instead of running and then react to the interaction with sample you hit the sample and you have your feedback working or with the delay we don't do that we pre-hop we pre-scan a particular area with four points we evaluate the maximum height and set up the hop amplitude and the resolution we require. So we vary resolution. We learn this from medical technique when you image the heart, the beating heart, you're interested in the high dynamic of the heart, but less interest in rest. So 
uh, other points will be taking just a relative position, for example. In this case, you can very rapidly image very complicated sample. It doesn't matter how complicated it is. And you can see the neural network and you see this dendrite and they often not attached to the surface. They actually stretch and it's like octopus in space. In this case, it doesn't matter. You always approach vertically and you never break any system. Uh, the system is this, for example, in Kanazawa, uh, you see optical microscopy and, and ion conductor on the top, there's just some control and some other for electrophysiology and this classical uh, scanning probe microscopy technique. So it's no different. It's actually, the first cell I got with that was just obtained with atomic force microscopy controller. Uh, just a few examples. You can see this neuronal network uh, or neuron with a very complex uh, system. You see glial cell underneath, it's a complex co-culture. And you can zoom in particular area and pick up these very wrong processes uh, with a high resolution and completely non-invasively. You can operate in any physiological condition and it, it doesn't interfere. And the pipette is uh, incredibly easy to use. It's very easy to get such images. Uh, just a couple of more examples of neurons, how complicated network could be. Like a number C, you can see here. This uh, axon is about uh, 50 nanometer in diameter and it's suspended almost uh, a micron height in space. And it just runs from one dendrite to another to the synapse boot on here. And you can grab these pictures with big ease and this kind of zoom from this area. Other things, for example, this is kind of the most difficult sample for any scanning probe microscopy at a hair cell in organ cortex, it's just what does our hearing. The stereocilia, which form these bundles, they connect it with a link, protein link, like you can see here on electron microscopy, this kind of microvilla nearby. You can see this microvilla could be imaged. Again, no, 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 no other scanning probe microscopy can see it. And uh, detect with such a resolution. And we can see this link, they're about 10 nanometer in diameter, and we can scan them. I always compare with the Tower Bridge in London. We have such a bridge with a rope or kind of a chain between the pillars, and you can see, and even some protein complexes on the surface. So you can image multiple times, make a movie, and you will never damage them. That is the biggest advantage to that because cell will respond other way mechanically to the stimuli. Just the other example, for example, this is a cardiomyocyte, part of cardiomyocyte, a big cell, very straighted and it's not attached to the substrate. You can image and look at in detail how this Z-line group, sarcomere and tubular entry. So you can depict quite nicely cells and structures. This is kind of epithelial cells with, which have this microvilla and ridges. Uh, kidney epithelial, and you can see this, they form a very, very interesting structure and it's incredibly dynamic and they could be like one, two micron high and we can easily image them and we can study hydrogel, which is again, very difficult for any other scanning for microscopy. This is a collagen fiber and because some people grow cells in it and this is the case, you can see a cell growing in this matrix. Okay, this is a low resolution, but if you do a high resolution, you can see bands on uh, the uh, collagen fiber, which classically you will easily detect with AFM, but only on a flat sample, not in hydrogen. Uh, the resolution is rather limited. Of course, it depends on the size of the pipette, but we can get a few nanometer resolution. In this case, it's an S-layer protein, which just used as a calibration sample. And if you apply some Fourier filter, you can uh, to that you can even see some structure of protein organized, which roughly have like a 12 nanometer pitch, and recognize that. But what you can do, you can actually see it on live cell. In this case, for example, we use some uh, sperm. Again, you see this variable resolution here. They're not much picked up on the background, so we can very quickly rush uh, and then get high resolution of the structure which we pick up. It's all automatic and there are no parameters practically to send for scanning. No gain, nothing like that, because everything done without feedback control. So it gives you absolutely predictable picture all the time and no parameters to tune except the resolution number of pixels you want to require. 
Uh, on the right side, it's not an error because we don't have error image uh, classically, which we will have an atomic force. It's a slope. I uh, will further show if you uh, process this image and plot the cosine of the angle of pipette to the surface and plot it uh, uh, in this way, it's like electron microscopy. People often love to see that. You see lots of detail in the image. And of course, if you go to the high resolution, especially after acrosome reaction, which we trigger on the sperm in equatorial region, this particular uh, region, like a ton, produced, and it's a, a, a number of adherent protein uh, exposed. And this is the area responsible for attaching sperm to the egg. If you look at the pre structure electron microscope, it's all integral protein, so they're quite immobile or very small, small dynamic there. And this is electron scanning electron microscopy. You see this area, of course, here, lots of artifacts would be here. But if we do this live imaging, we can see, for example, two frame, where you see all these complex protein complexes remain more or less intact or slightly turn, and some of them undergo some change. If you look at a little bit higher resolution, you easily can see these protein complexes on the cell surface. and two frame of this kind of movie, you can recognize quite a number of structure, but some changes undergo and you can detect that. Uh, it's good comparison. We always compare with some electron microscopy and electron micro microscopy, especially Hitachi. This is guys in Japan did it. Uh, this is very interesting because if you see on the right, it's uh, just uh, cell culture made electron microscopy normally how they will prepare. And you would see quite a number of artifacts because on the left, it's already with artifacts because it's a fixed, but it's the same area of the same culture image with two techniques, ion conductance microscopy and scanning electron microscopy. You would see here all 3D picture, how they look like after fixation and how many artifacts created by the preparation. Now they often use this ion conductance microscopy to visualize the sample and try to adapt the technique for fixation and sample preparation to come as close as possible with electron microscopy because they always will be affected. All sizes will be wrong because drying and shrinking of the cell is so dramatic and it's not uh, uniform across the sample. So a number of artifacts you create it is incredible. So it's quite important to see High resolution picture with ion conductance to know what is real and what is the artifact. This is just exactly another thing that Hitachi works on it and try to compare with SICM. This is again the same area image with electron microscope here and with ion conductance. Okay, this is fixed, so this is structure a little bit smaller, maybe because then again they shrink during fixation. But you see this, for example, like the tripod or three legs or microvilli. And this is the same here image. So you see, I recognize the same structure image with electron microscope, and you see how much artifact there compared with the imaging design conductance. I'm not talking about other debris which is appeared there, which is nothing to do with the sample. And there are quite tons of this data show the differences. Uh, but because we study a live cell, for us, it's not a big problem. It's non-contact mode. For example, when uh, kidney epithelial cells form these dynamic ridges, you can see how this structure dynamic move around. And this is actually the pinocytosis, if you will follow its repeating movie, but in this area, particular, it's now form the ridge and just the forming taken away. If you look at fluorescence, it will be there. And again, showing this uh, slow mode is very nice. Similar maybe with your, with your error image, but it's nothing to do with the error. It's how we plot the topography. We take this topography and take the slope uh, of the pipette, angle pipette to the surface. And if you form that, you see a very nice picture all the time with all the detail if fine things detected. Because other way, just scaling a grayscale, we're just missing lots and lots of detail. In this case, it's the leading edge of this human epithelial cells, how they interact with each other. And you can see that kind of a movie because you can do live movie uh, like that. Another example, it's just a number of movies I just show, like for example, neural network, you can zoom and image forever and see all the dynamic changes happen. And by that growth going of the neuron, how it's modifying in time, how it's react. And you can image and 
it's uh, with great ease you don't have any problem because the system is constantly will get you a very good quality image now the beauty of the pipad is it's such a uh, so many functions and they already were developed so you can develop quite a number of sensor and they just show just a small fraction it's like a tip of the eye with how you can combine that together of course with the optics in biology it's a necessity because lots of biological objects now have tons of probes fluorescent probe where we can mark a particular protein particular structure uh, which we can link to the function and in this case we can combine that very nicely what the reason we even designed surface confocal so we can not only look for a fluorescent marker inside but just follow a, a surface in this case it's very interesting if you position and scan normal confocal you slicing with a particular step cells and generate all the images you potentially can combine all this fluorescent to that but the disadvantage you cannot do any qual uh, quantitative data because you never know where your focus comes to and photo bleaching why you're doing step by step in our case it's like a sewing machine you just scan 3d sample but your laser sport focus on the tip of the pipette where the surface so in one scan you're getting topography with uh, overlay fluorescent it's the same image obtaining is still too much but we can now compare intensity of each spot because they taken from the same position in a, a focal plane even on the flat surface if there are any small slope we can uh, uh, compensate by scanning and have a very quantitative information comparison we do lots of comparison of fluorescent molecule when the uh, 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 quantitative uh, data needed just example how we use for clapping and the cytosis probably i just would create very too much time uh, you can see these pits, it's like a depression, they're about 100 nanometer. And we can combine with GFE, green fluorescent protein, and see what we found that for clustering and the cytosis is not going in a classical way, how it was uh, depicted from electron microscopy, but actually it goes in a very different way. So if you in this movie, the small hole appeared, but then it's covered with a like a cup. So that is what you would see on some electron micrograph and the stretch structure started to form and close and for example here but not like depicting so practically the model was describing the whole book now is rewritten so it was thought that going that and dynamine just pinch that but it's rather aborted bits which not form actually it's always form in the cup it's more like a micro pinus it was it's a number of things you can measure with that and do dynamically it's about seven seconds per frame but it's a small frame they are not very elaborated, so we can do very quickly. Seven, nine seconds per frame. If it's a low resolution and uh, kind of slower, you can see kind of this phenomenon. These darker pits appeared, and every time before they disappear, you see like a white wave coming in the top. So it's practically the pit is closing. And now it was confirmed by under with a uh, high speed SICM PAM uh, he's trying to do. So it's quite nicely that we can do that and be pioneer. A couple of other things, uh, because I'm an electrophysiologist, for me, use electrophysiological recording where can we measure one molecule, a complex molecule in function and how they transport iron. We can do that practically uh, by using this technique. We not only can study that, but we can actually position them to the particular position of the cell. We can get a picture and it's a like, guided missile navigate to a particular position, let's say, over neuron and record iron channels. And uh, so we do again combine with fluorescence this is a necessity because we stay in active synapses so we load in them with a, a particular fluorescent dye during the activity of this so we know this uh, uh, button or synapse actively working and we can find them on the cell surface and what is important with and then make electrophysiological recording this you see axon because it's always bendy because it's a very different structure than dendrite and record ion channel so we first time you know like can now assess what kind of ion channel and signaling going in neurons we know all the electrical activity of cells come from there but we actually did know not 
didn't know much about actually synapses or axon because they were not accessible for us. Now we can do lots of measurement there. We can study particular boutons and see it surrounding and map different channels. And more importantly, we can go to cell, cold cell, which is again, very interesting. It, it's impossible if you see a very sharp pipette like 100 nanometer. But now we can get a high resolution picture with sharp pipette and then resize the pipette to get inside the button or axon. And it's done in a very primitive way. So we can do in controllable way approach and chop the pipette to known uh, diameter. We just set up in the software, we want 20% increase of the diameter and we can make a multiple increase and actually re-change the shape to the required size, like this one was changed to that. So that gives us a very easy approach to the button. If you go, we can get to it, get the whole seal, you will see capacitive signal. And in this case, we load in this fluorescent dye uh, a whole axon with these buttons on the whole way. So it's a quite incredible way we can do now this nanomanipulation, nanosurgery, electrophysiology. So lots of things could be now done with ease, practically all what you do and all patching, breaking, and getting just with the, your mouse and the computer. And this is just example how you're recording. You see this button again. The fluorescence not always give you a good chance to navigate because like this particular synapse is accessible. It's on the top of the dendrite. This one is formed under. So if you approach from the top, you actually cannot get onto that. So we can easily avoid uh, recording, which normally happen, happen in electrophysiology because they blind when they go and record something. And this is, for example, how we can acquire from synapses lots of currents and test drugs now. So it's open the whole possibilities in working on it. I didn't show a number of papers we now published on that. We do a lot of work with cardiomyocytes. This is, again, a very interesting story because it happened that cardiomyocytes have a distribution of ion channels very not uniform. And if you look, it's a very straight structure with T tubules, but most of the ionic system is actually linked to this T tubule opening. And this is where uh, coupling happen in the cell. And we actually, our pipette is sharper and we can go quite deep inside and study ion channel inside the structure. In this case, the calcium channel and practically build some map like this uh, chemical transistor, which allow us very nice propagation of action potential for the heart very slowly because we want that heart will contract and pump the blood, not like a neuron immediate response. So that is all achieved by this very clever distribution of ion channel. We can do it, uh, this microscopy, not only vertically, we can do on the angle because there was an aim to study some tissue and that is, a, uh, or get an accessible part. So we can actually work with upright microscope. We can get a fluorescence and with water immersion objective and <clears throat> people that will scan and get under the ankle and you can see how it's organized. So practically, if you do vertically, you will see kind of cardiomyocytes with its striation, but this part of the cell, uh, intercalated disc, where lots of interesting channels, especially sodium channel, which do a coupling between cells because they don't have any potential uh, propagation it goes through from cell to cell. But in this case, we just can position the pipette on the angle. And in this case, we image intercalated disc. So you see in great detail. And we can study out now ion channels in this case. And we did quite a number of interesting discovery there. Uh, finding a very strong clustering of a very specific sodium channel on each place where the uh, most of them will be found. And you will see most of the patches will be without anything, but and then high clustering of cells. So it's opening quite a right now the possibilities to work with very complicated and elaborated sample. Uh, local delivery, it's a pipette. I always Try to say to be bad, it's a fantastic thing. So we, we have a channel and say infinite in, you can put anything into it and deliver locally. And this is how cells work to each other, talk to each other. It's not like you put into the dish some chemical and everyone facing the same fate. Cells communicate, neuron communicate with neurotransmitter, the signal, local signal, paracrine regulation, and signal diminishing and removed. It's all very, very uh, punctuated and very localized. Now we can study that. 
but what you can do, just see how pipetting works. Just make a double barrel pipette. It's very easy. Just buy a pipette with a septum mean. It's a kind of theta glass. And you can just, for example, apply voltage. And in this case, you can scan in air. And in this case, on the oil, you can position, for example, droplet of water. But just applying voltage, you can put electrosmotic flow and create a ray, for example, a bubble. Very nice for studying nanochemistry. You can put 200 nanometer droplets, this kind of with fluorescence. And it's very easy with voltage. You can regulate. You can easily uh, add volume to that, change that photo bleach something, make a different addition to the each droplet. I just example, mix different color in that, or put, for example, like a one molecule of DNA for green fluorescent protein and start to synthesize green fluorescent protein and then stop the reaction. So you can suddenly do something very interesting like a nanochemistry with practically a known amount of molecule in the system and in very small while. Uh, of course, it, it's not only pipetting, you can deliver the molecule, it's very easy. In this case, for example, with, uh, with some uh, antibody, uh, fluorescently labeled, and I just go on the glass and done with, uh, in this case, we just draw the square. Of course, it's photo bleaching, uh, the recording happen with uh, fluorescent microscopy. But you can do in more elaborated ways, so print some letters, pattern, this is, we work a lot with Cambridge, University and this is like logo. This different antibody reaction you can mix and interaction. In this case, student was playing with the face of Newton. He download the picture uh, from the web and just uh, uh, start to deposit uh, DNA binding to the surface. And you can see, okay, the surface was not treated well, but you can recognize the face. You practically it's like inject printer where you can actually print and actually in 3D, it's not only will be because it's a full feedback control. So you can do grayscale deposition. Just making this double barrel pipette gives you a very easy chance to operate without any liquid outside. Because if pipette is double barrel and you put your electric diffusion off, let's say iron from one barrel to another, then it always will have a meniscus and you will always have a current. As soon as you approach the surface, current will broke. So you can do a feedback very nicely deposited. And you can print a very different picture now in color. Yeah, and this is student was playing with Valerie Degas. So he just put a picture and printed. And you can do this kind of color deposition and create any pattern. But the idea that you can actually deliver molecule very accurately from the pipette and it's in very controllable way. We use it for drug testing, for example, uh, you can sense this with electrochemistry. In this case, you can profile, you actually image the profile of electrochemically active reagent, which uh, uh, like this hexamineral ruthenium, and you can image the distribution and measure that. So you would see the pipette, it's a topography, and this is a chemical picture. So you can scan in 3D, image the chemical distribution. That's very interesting. We use, for example, for drug testing, a sensory neuron we study a lot. Uh, ah, sorry, come on. Uh, we study a particular receptor. It's a trp one channel. Uh, and the capsaicin, it's an ingredient of the normal pepper or chili, or chili. What it does, this uh, chemical react with our receptor, normal heat receptor, because if you touch hot water, you will feel it. And this is exactly what it does. This is why we feel uh, heat from the pepper, because it's just fooling our receptor. But the idea, what this receptor does, it's introduced entry of calcium, so we can record just this fluorescence. So we can apply this chemical by pressure, by voltage, or look at how the distances work, and actually see the cellular response, whatever we apply and see how the fluorescence will change because calcium will enter through this channel to the cell. But the beauty, we can make a very fast drug screening element because we use a lot of drug to actually reduce because this trp one channel is not only heat, but it's also pain. Because if you know, if you touch something very hot, you may have pain in your uh, fingers. So that is uh, lots of analgetic drugs developed in this direction. So in this case, normally we work for a GSK company and it would take us a week to get a one dose response like that. 
but in this case we can actually make a thousands of these uh, dose response in one hour because we locally apply and we can go from point to point in this case like the eight position was recorded and the voltage correspond just concentration apply and this is what you would see we, we can create a number of those response in no time it's practically a very very small sample especially like we uh, sometimes work with a human neuron and we may have few cells just for study in this case we can get a lot of data and uh, the synthesization also very little happened because we don't overload cell with calcium we don't poison it and uh, we can uh, apply and stop application instantly in two milliseconds we can uh, sense many things we can apply potassium in this case with the help of patch pumping we can record this distrib functional distribution of for example, uh, KETP channel on cardiomyocyte surface. So practically amplitude of this peak, current peak, which you hear here, you see when we pass, the pipette pass over the channel, small chemical gradient create a current because there are not much potassium voids. And we can detect this and we see the clustering of channels in the T-tubal region. Actually, we have much more data to that, but I wouldn't show now. But the idea you can actually make quite a nice uh, benefit get from this local application because you can functionally map something. Like in this case, you can functionally map and study receptor like beta two receptor which trigger uh, cyclic uh, AMP signal and responsible for actually our heart work. In this case, we compare normal cardiomyocyte with just part of it with the straight structure and after heart attack, failing heart. What is actually happening uh, during this failing situation? A lot of these uh, uh, tubules they just disappear, cells swell, and they just break like sausages. And the receptors start to distribute. It. And actually, what we found that beta two receptor mainly located inside the tubules, and beta one distributed more or less equally everywhere. In this case, redistribution happened, and we can use just a FRAT signal to investigate that. You can measure, uh, just to save the time, uh, we, we can measure lots of parameters, like the surface charge density or estimate. You can use gradient, and there are a number of paper now here with this microscopy where I can use just a simply different potential. And in this case, if you uh, cover the glass with polylysing positively charged, glass is more negatively charged. So if your pipette approach, your potential will change in different direction. So you can scan in iron mode, but record the potential and get a map of distribution. We use it for the cell and it's quite nice. The sperm cell would have a very interesting, it's attached with the polylysing to the surface. Polylysing is more yellowish and more brown. It's a more negative charge. So you will see that head, and especially the equatorial region is quite negatively charged and especially the flagella with lots of cation transport happen and then you can see that it's very interesting because we didn't have a chance before to see the charge distribution on cell and if you look at this principal piece you see this slightly allocated this is where the mitochondria sit it's like an engine which helps sperm to swing and this area is incredibly positively charged again this is where oxygen consumption and exchange of chloride to CO2 for bicarbonate happen. And this is, again, could facilitate transport to such a membrane. I just a high resolution in the head. So you can get reasonably high resolution, very easy imaging of the cell. Mechanical measurement. Okay, this is where atomic force microscopy known quite good, but not very good for cells. And here we can compete very nicely with that. And it could be done in many different way now quite a number of people started to use that first you can just apply pressure that is non-contact mechanical application is always very good i always compare with the like eyeball pressure people tested in early age just metal spring was applied to the eye it was very painful not very accurate now you come to the microscope they apply just a puff of air and see the deformation this is similar things you can apply positive or no blood pressure or negative so you can do quite a number of measurements and it's very easy to recalculate what will be the elastic modulus because you don't need to, to calculate all the tape and everything. 
So simply, if you do, let's say, on neurons, which are very soft, if you deform, you would see a very easy deformation at the beginning. So we have quite a membrane before reaching major cellular skeleton core, and then it will be deformation. Pulling the membrane out is much uh, easier. You'd require a very, very little effort because they are very small attachments to the cytoskeleton and it's free to go. And you can do it on cardiomyocytes, TTEF, you can compare. We can also see this two slope, the initial one very soft, and then you see how with FM probably the first one is more very difficult to detect. What we found if you do a failing heart and normal cell, you would see very quickly the difference. It's normally straight, it's structure will have a very nice mechanical characteristic, it's a very nice peak, but as soon as you go to uh, uh, heart failure, you would see a very strange cell. They actually contract, not uniformly. They kind of bend in like a caterpillar. And you would see that some regions become much softer when some become much harder. You can image with that. You now suddenly see like a, a women who fall into the swimming pool. You know, you suddenly see all underlying structure because you blow and you see immediately lots of underlying structure, probably like any mechanical measurement. But you can do in different way. You can use without pressure and see this intrinsic. And it was a very nice paper published that. So you can image and look how the displacement happened, calibrate, it, for example, on decaying or different things. And uh, you can very easily use during the imaging. So you will see the topography on the left. This again, our slope image, which show you detail, and mechanical map, which you will get very, very easily. So it's very nice to use for the relatively small, soft sample. And you can compare drugs like we've worked now lots of this cancer cell. At Tuxol, you will see that cell become much harder. We can compare with AFM, it has some similarity, but often we would have no problem with a very close to the surface when the interaction will be affected. It's very, very comparable. Uh, with electrochemistry, we can combine very nice with electrochemistry, and this is again bringing another dimension. Uh, uh, and I've seen Toyota got quite a number of this microscope to study lithium battery, and we work with that with the Japanese in collaboration. So the beauty of it, you can actually uh, put to the glove box, so to remove oxygen and uh, fill the pipa at this particular solution and study your sample. But the beauty at each point. Uh, this kind of contact, you can measure charging, discharging characteristic, and measure lots of things. So you can actually look how this charge, charge happen. You can build a map, and this could be very quick because at each point you just take the uh, charge, discharge characteristic, and watch how it happens. So you actually can suddenly study the battery at nanoscale with a function, not just by the structure, and you measure the real electrical characteristic. We start to move a lot and work with a fuel cell. And now different material is very interesting because of how hydrogen evolution happened. Again, you can get reasonably high resolution. In this case, it's molybdenum bisulfate, the semiconductor material which formed this type of star crystal. And what we found that uh, uh, the red line here showed a very high activity on the edges. And that's very important because you see how potential can shift. So practically, creating a pyramid with lots of edges create a very high uh, effectiveness of such a battery. So practically studying at nanoscale, it helps us to develop and functionally study to develop a structure which will be most effective. It's just an example. So if you different potential, you would see them, then everything become the same, but at lower potential, this will work. And this is what normally will be done. You can use very easily the other probe. Uh, and again, it requires a second to produce if you smoke by any chance. You can get a lighter and put a butane gas from your kind of normal camping gas, uh, uh, put white tube into the pipette, heat with a pad, and you will do, uh, form the carbon electrode very easily. And the reproducibility is just incredible. This is just how it looks. One barrel will be filled with carbon, another could be empty. And this is what we use for in conductance microscope. If you chop the pipette, you can see how carbon is stronger and sticking out. You can see analysis. And what you can do with that, you can do lots of imaging. Oh, I think I'll image one. You can 
uh, image the cell and see the distribution of particular zinc, oxygen, peroxide. In this case, we can use this configuration to stimulate and to record a neurotransmitter release and go in particular cell, just show without much imaging. We can go inside the cell, generate, generate different electrochemical signal. We can go inside the cell very easy and make a ROS detection. And the beauty is such a probe you can use not only for imaging, you can plug into the, let's say, mouse, which has a cancer and test the drug and record such a thing. So it's the same probe could be so versatile that you can scan and make independently measured something. And you can create a transistor. It's a very quick just because you can bring it to your imaging. Uh, it's like a fat transistor. Again, you take a pipette, the size is uh, practically restricted to the dimension, which is very easy to reproduce. In this case, you solve the major problem for design of non-electronic. You create, for example, two electrodes isolated by a glass or quartz, separated with one 10 nanometer, and then you can fill with carbon. And now creating semiconductor gate uh, generate receptor, you completely isolate it and only gate amplifier sits there. You can do quite a number of measurements you can put different semiconductor like graphene, you know, polypyrrole, molybdenum bisulfate. In this case, it's a very nice gauging system, very nice pH meter, and you can record lots of things, go to the tissue, very important, like the breast cancer tissue and record and from melanoma cell. You can generate quite a number of sensors, just uh, adding enzyme, you can detect, for example, ATP with very high sensitivity, and you can perform and move towards the cell, see the gradient which generated from the cell, uh, see the response of the cell, or penetrate into the cell to measure, for example, ATP level. So you have quite a number of possibilities with this very simple pipette. You can create a ion conduct, uh, ion-based transistor, which is of course much more advanced because most of uh, semiconductor they too slow. This is one, and has, this one has much higher sensitivity because you have a single molecular sensitivity. In this case, one barrel filled with carbon, another one with a semiconductor, and we can grow that to generate the right, uh, different dimension for the opening. And in this case, it could be sensed and gated, for example, DNA molecule translocation. We can stop moving molecule out and detect the single pulses, which we will see, and different, depending on different gauge, and we can allow different amount molecule and see translocation of single molecule. And you can design a very nice probe. So if we attach a particular antibody sensitive to that, your pore is so small that it would sense, uh, if you see on the first graph, this very fast peak translocation, and just uh, one particular single protein passing through this nanopore. And because antibody doesn't match that, so nothing would happen. But as soon as, like this insulin antibody, you detect them, you detect the target, you straight away see that molecule is not just passing with a very fast transition, but slow down and spend some time and higher concentration more and more. So it's very easy to detect with a molecular precision single molecule. And uh, another example, for example, you can use like create a very fast pH meter. It's probably the fastest pH meter known to us. You just tip the pipette in particular, like this polylysin protein mixture. It's immediately this osmotic uh, uh, capillary force will fill a little bit, then it will dry to the membrane. You can cross-link it. And now you have a perfect sensor. So if you cut it, you will see this membrane. But the beauty of it, you can image with that. In this case, you image the proton uh, which we supply through the pipette, just applying the voltage, and you see the peak uh, of a gradient of proton, which we can image. And this, we use just a step to this gradient with a PSN. We can see response of the pH meter, so it's a millisecond range. Uh, we can measure very accurately, but what is important, we can measure now everywhere, for example, near the cells, how it changed, for example, with algae when pH become very high or acidic secreted cell, but we can image with that. So go around the cell and see the pH leaking on different distance. But there's some interference, so we generate it because if proton is very high, it will uh, slightly uh, 
change our topographical features. So we just separate the two barrels. One contains the pH sensitive membrane, another not. So you see one is just normal for feedback control, another is sensor. So we can scan cells and group of cells. In this case, the stem cancer cell and see how they uh, generate proton because they go to glycolis and this is considered to be very aggressive and they become very acidifying everything and uh, could promote cancer further. And we can compare with gene analysis and now link to the single cell analysis for the particular proton secreting thing. We can look how in time it changes. We can look at other cells which are very uh, diverse, for example, like melanoma cells. So you would see topography or group of cells growing in the culture and which and where they secrete the proton. So the proton is also very important because all processes depend on that and these cells regulate. So we may look at microenvironment a lot of lots of interesting things. I already come out of the time a little bit. So what the project we are talking about it just uh, our idea was to set up together the system which would uh, have benefit of both. In this case, it's kind of a first product from NTMDT and ICAPIC where we put this marlin. We have combined SICM, a head which could be easily replaced with AFM, with all the AFM controller, which currently exists for many customers. And potentially it's also combining with the uh, Raman spectroscopy, so quite a number of things advance where the PPAD or cantilever can be used. And of course, it can be combined with the more uh, important things like high resolution imaging. You know, you can do mechanical measurement that may be a, a, a kind of a stronger material where you can go to megapascal, which you wouldn't be able to with PPAD. So it could be a very interesting project, and we hope we'll, we'll find its application. So thank you very much. I just want to thank everyone. It's just my collaborator, some grants which support me. Uh, so thank you very much. If any question, please ask. Yeah, Yuri, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a wonderful talk. And uh, I think uh, everybody liked it. Uh, it's, it's, it's very informative and about something new. So uh, we got a couple of questions. So uh, first, like the short question, <laughs> why Marlene? <laughs> well, why, why, uh, why nice question. Uh, it's a, this uh, fish is uh, quite incredible. It's, it reminds me of Pipat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your cantilever tip, you know. So it's it's interesting. We're probably fishing with it. Yeah, yeah, it is. and uh, Marlin is known for very high speed. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the beauty because I believe uh, this is maybe what I didn't say about hopping. The advantage of it uh, that because the pipette is so sharp, it's like arrow. It can go straight to the sample very quickly because it doesn't interact much with the water. So it depends only on speed of the piezo. So we can actually go very fast. At the moment, I know that already a uh, group in Germany and uh, under group there, they are already achieving not completely video rate, but 10 frames per second. So, uh, but uh, they look at rather simple samples. So I don't know how it will perform on cells, but it's quite promising. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, how would you compare your solution with uh, those which are presented by other producers? Uh, if SICM, I uh, maybe quickly give a history because uh, in '95, I think I met Paul Hansma and he was very uh, surprised that uh, he's seen the picture of a cell, you know, uh, image with his technique because he kind of almost gave up on it. Uh, but from that time, it's actually not so many people were interested. Actually, FM community was quite. Uh, they know that they can get a very high resolution with their cantilever and why you need something else. Because they started to face some problem that not everything in biology could be easily addressed. And second, my feeling that even people somehow didn't like much solution and kind of electrodes, you know, it's something, it's kind of, it was my feeling. Because what I've seen in Huntsman group, it, how it was assembled, it looks like, 
I think his wife, uh, electrophysiologist, might be. This is where he's got from. Other way, I don't know. Other way, how you will be going to this direction? And uh, normally, they never expected the high resolution. The people who start to produce practically, we started first to produce that as a zinoscope, uh, which then kind of come away from us. Then Park learned from us. They spent three months with us almost learning everything, but somehow. It didn't go finally how we wanted, and they started to produce something. But I, I'm not very much impressed with their system, and I don't see much result uh, coming from that. I see the system which we use from Icapic or somebody, what comes from our lab, actually we've been producing much better data. Uh, so what, this is what I can say. I know that that system pretty slow, and there's lots of limitation. I think. Uh, uh, the software is a major problem because you probably need quite a good control and understand what you're doing with the keypad. And that's it, I believe. Uh, okay. So maybe. Uh, so, so what I would say that uh, I haven't seen much of a uh, result. So this is only my kind of doubt about it. But generally, uh, we. Uh, wanted to support ourselves, you know, because constantly updating computer, new card, new program, where to get a grant. So they, initially the practical company was created to support the research and all community we have currently who works with that. Lots of my people who work in the lab, they design a very similar system and put there, so it's practically helped for us. And now we realize that lots of our colleagues want this system, so and this is why it went and hopefully with your system combining with atomic force microscopy it could find a much better application and much wider yes uh, i uh, i i'm pretty sure we are having some interesting times coming it's not about <laughs> not only about virus but about uh, scanning pro microscopy overall so dear colleagues thank you once again uh, for attending our webinar and uh, see you on our next online event. Have a good St. Paris. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye, everyone.